Welcome to the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church of Memphis Incorporated YouTube channel. And thank you so much for joining us. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for wanting to be with us. We pray now that you would guide us through your word that we may uh, learn how to want to be with you more and uh, help us to value the connection between our faith and our works. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our text for today is found in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. That's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. It reads, and this is the English Standard Version, it reads, By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. And by this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Uh, week before last, we talked about Abel and his faith worshiping. Uh, his gift that he brought to God was connected to him or he was connected to his gift. Two can't be uh, separated. We must remember that our gifts are connected to us. And it's our attitude that determines whether the gift is acceptable to God. Uh, and we know that uh, his brother Cain, uh, his gift was not accepted by God and it was basically because of his attitude. And then uh, last week we talked about uh, Enoch and faith walking, how he walked with God. And then he was translated, uh, that word translated uh, uh, means that he was carried across the remaining troubles of this world that he had ahead of him. He was carried, carried across those to eternity with God. Uh, and then this week we're talking about Noah faith working, faith working. Now, Noah's faith involved the whole person. His mind was warned of God and his heart was moved to fear God and his will acted upon what God told him. And, and, and when our faith uh, deals with our minds, our hearts, and our will, then we are more capable of walking by faith because our works, good works, will line up with our faith. It will show our faith or demonstrate our faith. Since nobody at that time had ever seen a flood or perhaps even a rainstorm and definitely not a tsunami, Noah's actions must have caused a great deal of interest and probably a lot of ridicule uh, as well. People started making fun of him. So Noah's faith influenced his whole family and they were saved. We must, uh, well, well I, I'll touch on that a little later on. It, it also condemned the whole world, Noah's faith, for his faith revealed their unbelief. The flood proved that Noah was right. The, the flood did come. Now, Peter refers to Noah's warning in his day in 2 Peter chapter 1 through 5. It says, but false prophets also arose among the people just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly being uh, bring destruction and uh, destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, who died for them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. 
and many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you and with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep. For if, for if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. And if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a heralder of righteousness, a preacher of righteousness with seven others in his family, in his household. When he brought the, when God brought a flood upon the world, of the ungodly, they were caught unprepared. There's a warning going out today. Work while it's day, for the night comes when no man can work, and 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 and, and it will be too late. So heed the warning while you can, while the blood is still running warm in your veins. Jesus used this experience to warn people to be ready for his return in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36 through 42. Now in Noah's day, the people were involved in innocent everyday activities and completely ignored Noah's witness. Genesis chapter six, verse 14 through 22 is about a faithful man who worked for God. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him and he will show them his covenant. That's Psalms 25 verse 15. When you walk with God, he speaks to you through his word and tells you what you need to know and to do. Christians are more than just servants who do his will. We're also his friends who know his plan. That's John chapter 15, verse 14 through 15. God's plan involves three responsibilities for Noah and his family. The first responsibility was the building of an ark. God told Noah what his task was and it was to build a wooden vessel that would survive the water of the flood and keep Noah and his family safe. If the, the cubit mentioned was the standard cubit of 18 inches, then the vessel was about 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. It most likely had three decks and one door. That just took my mind to Jesus. I am the way. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Only one door, one way to God. Uh, it had three decks and one door and a series of small windows uh, 18 inches high right under the roof, providing light and ventilation. The three decks were divided into compartments where the various animals would uh, be kept and where Noah and his family would live. This vessel was designed for flotation and not navigation. I'll say that again. This ark that Noah built was designed for flotation and not navigation. Life is much like that ark. It's designed for flotation because Jesus is the captain and the Holy Spirit is the navigator. It was a huge wooden box that could float on the water 
and keep the contents safe and dry. That basically was the purpose of the bulrush container that Moses' uh, mother placed him in. Uh, Dr. Henry Morris calculated that the ark was large enough to hold the content of over 500 livestock, what, what, um, 500 livestock railroad cars. That is big. Big enough to hold 500 livestock railroad cars, providing space for about 125,000 animals. And of course, many of the animals would be very small and not need much space. And when it came to the large animals, Noah no doubt collected younger and smaller representatives of those animals. There was plenty of room in the ark, the vessel for the animals, for Noah and his family, and for food, both human and animal. And the insects and creeping things would not have uh, a, a problem finding places to live on such a large ark. Now, the first responsibility was building the ark. The second responsibility was trusting God's covenant, trusting the Lord, trusting what he said, even though they had not experienced it. That's faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Flood had not been, been seen, but they acted as though it was within view. This is the first use of the word covenant in the Bible. The word appears often in scripture because the covenant concept is an important part of God's great plan of redemption. God would explain his covenant to Noah after the flood had resided and Noah and his family came off the ark. A covenant is an agreement that involves obligations and benefits for the parties involved. In some of the covenants, God alone is the covenant party and makes unconditional promises to his people. But there were also covenants that required his people to be to it, it, it required his people to fulfill certain conditions before God could bless them. God's word in Genesis chapter 6 verse 13 through 21 were addressed specifically to Noah, but God also included Noah's family in the covenant. In verse 18, Noah didn't become a father until he was about 500 years old. And that's in verse chapter five, verse 32. And he entered the ark when he was 600 years old. Chapter seven, verse six. So his three sons were still young as far as the pre-flood age were concerned. Now Ham were, was the youngest son and Japhat was the oldest son. And all three boys were married. Now the fact that God had covenanted to carry, to care for Noah and his family it should have given them the peace and confidence that they needed as they prepared the ark and then lived in it for over a year. It should have prepared them to, to go against the grain, the, the, the everyday day thinking, to, to stand in spite of the ridicule, the fun that was being made of, of them. Can you imagine how people laughed at them? because they didn't know what a flood was. And a lot of times what we uh, say concerning faith, there are people that don't understand and they might laugh at us, but we must stand strong and stay the course. 
Noah and his family was confident in God's plan during all of that ridicule of their neighbors, their friends, and their acquaintances. God gives us peace during all of the uncertainties of life. When troubles arise, God is a very present help in trouble. Life holds many unexpected and unknown circumstances, but yet God is faithful. God is faithful to keep his promises. And as God's covenanted people, the eight believers had nothing to worry about. So now we've covered uh, the first responsibility of building the ark the second responsibility of trusting God's covenant, now we come to gathering the animals. The third responsibility. Now, God not only wanted humans to be preserved from destruction, but he also uh, wanted every kind of creature that would be drowned by the waters of the flood to be saved. But how, how was Noah to gather such a large number of animals, birds and creeping things? God would cause these creatures to come to Noah. And God will cause people to come in our midst to hear, into our lives to hear the gospel the good news. And Noah would take them all into the ark. Remember when, when, when Peter and his bunch had fished all night and caught nothing? And Jesus showed up and told them, cast your net on the right side. And they did what he had, what he told them. They had not caught a fish all night. And then all of a sudden, when they obeyed the Lord, so many fish that the uh, boats with that they were in couldn't hold them all. And the, the boat started sinking, and then the other boats started coming to help them. Even now, all we have to do is cast a net and God will cause them to come into the ark of safety. Now this include, included not only pairs of unclean animals who would be able to reproduce after the flood, but also seven pairs of clean animals, some of whom would be used for sacrifice. Now Noah and his family not only learned about the faithfulness of God, but they also saw the sovereignty of God in action. When we walk by faith, the opportunity will show up for us to see the sovereignty of God in action. In his sovereignty, uh, in his sovereign power, God brought the animals to Noah and his sons and controlled them while they did his bidding. However, this magnificent demonstration of God's power didn't touch the hearts of Noah's neighbors. And they perished in the flood. The birds, the beasts, and creeping things knew their creator's voice and obeyed him. But people made in the image of God refused to heed God's call. So many will suffer in this day and age when, when Jesus is crying out, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, come unto me and I'll give you rest unto your soul. My, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. My yoke is easy and my burdens are light. Yet many are suffering because they won't heed the master's voice. Years later, or centuries later even, God would say through his servant, 
Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter one, verse three, the ox knows who his boss is. The muse knows the hand that feeds him. But Israel, my people, don't know up from down. And that's the message version of Isaiah chapter one, verse three. During the time of this important event, Noah was serving the Lord and bearing witness to a sinful world. For 120 years or so, God was long suffering towards careless and rebellious sinners, but they ignored his message and lost their opportunity for salvation. That's why it's important that, why, that we work while it's day, for the opportunity will always be there. God is still long suffering, not willing that any should perish. Noah, Noah was tasked with the building of the ark. The ark directs our attention to that vessel that takes us to Yahweh, to safety, to a place of peace. Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. My grandmother often used to mention a way out of nowhere. Jesus dying on, in our place to atone for our sins is our way out of this dying world to a world of eternal life. One Friday, on an old rugged cross on a hill called Calvary, Jesus hung, bled, and he died. And he opened the way for us to go to Yahweh, our creator, to be with him forever. When he died, they took him down and they buried him in a borrowed tomb. And, 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 and in three days, he rose from the dead, never to die again. And we can now say, done died one time, ain't going to die no more. So let us put works with our faith. For the time will come when all opportunities, when the door of opportunity will be closed, just like the door, the one door to that ark was closed. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for uh, being our way out of no way from death to life. And we pray that you would continue to show us how to live in a to live lives that are pleasing in your sight, how to make choices, how to be good examples, how to be a light in a dark world, no matter what the, the circumstances, no matter how we might be ridiculed or laughed at, help us to stay the course. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, that's it. I pray that God will bless you real good and that your time will be well spent in viewing this message. Take care. Know that God loves you. And I love you too. Because his love abides in me. And I believe it abides in you. You're viewing this video. So let us let God's love for sinners abound. Take care. See you next time. Bye-bye.